Hey everyone, welcome to another session in our virtual queue protect and archive event here. Good morning to all of those of you in the US and good afternoon if you're watching this from Europe. Appreciate everybody taking some time today. Now let's see if I can get my slides to advance. There we go. My name is Dan Duparin. I work in technical marketing with Quantum and I want to chat with you today about backing up petabytes and petabytes of files. And you can probably tell this, this session title is designed to be a little bit provocative, but uh, don't get too excited. I'm not going to give you permission to not protect your data. What I hope to do is show you some different ways that you can think about protecting your data that might make your life a bunch easier. Now, I want to start off with a, a little story, true story. A couple of years ago, I was at one of these events that the big backup software vendors put on. It was their, their national event, a lot of people there, and they had a trade show floor area for their partners, and they'd invited Quantum to participate. So I'm there with my colleagues in the Quantum booth, and we're approached by a gentleman who wanted to talk about his backups because he was, he was really, really worried. He had data that was growing very rapidly, and he was really struggling trying to complete his backups on time. Things weren't working well, and uh, he was in a bad spot already. And he could see that in another year, things were going to be just catastrophic and not work. So he was looking for new ideas. So we did what we usually do. We asked him a few questions. You know, first up, how much data are we talking about here? And he said, well, it's about 650 terabytes. And this was a few years ago, and that was, that was a pretty good pile of data for the time. Still is, really. So we said, okay, that's um, it's a good pile of data. What, what is it, though? You know, can you break it down for us roughly? And he said, sure. It's really just two categories. There's about 50 or 60 terabytes of this IT stuff, departmental shares, VM backups, databases, all that sort of stuff that every company has. But the other 600 terabytes is all geospatial imagery and mapping data and things like that. So he said, oh, that's, that's very interesting. So let me guess, the, the 600 terabytes is the part that's growing really fast and that's, that's killing you, right? And he said, he said, yeah, that's true. And this is a story we hear all the time. And it's a manifestation of this right here. The amount of data in the world that is unstructured, things like large files, video, imagery, genomic sequences, IoT sensor data streams, LIDAR, all that sort of stuff is just the growth of that is vastly outpacing all other types of data like email and databases. And IDC here you know, they have their crystal ball and they think that by 2025, 80% of the data in the world is going to be these unstructured data types. Now, I have a crystal ball too, and I bet mine doesn't work any better than theirs does. But I think they're crazy because my crystal ball says we may have already reached this point. And certainly with our friend at the backup show, you know, this was a couple of years ago, 90% of his data was large unstructured data types. So if this is not a problem you're facing today, it is a problem that you will face because these data types pop up in every industry. I mean, at a minimum, everybody is using video for surveillance, for monitoring manufacturing lines, for all sorts of purposes, for retail analytics. So like I said, if you don't have this problem with unstructured data today, you likely will. So let's talk about that a bit more. This data is special for a few reasons. One is its size and its growth rate, but there are a few other things. It's usually part of some sort of a digital production line or a digital factory, as I sometimes call it. Data is created or acquired. It then spends some time where it needs to live on high-speed storage to be processed or analyzed or munged in some way with other data. And then eventually an end product is produced and that data product needs to be kept for a long time. And very often all the input data needs to be kept as well. Because who knows, next year you might have a better algorithm and you want to reanalyze it. Now that data also is not as valuable if it's sitting on dead storage. If it's on a tape on a shelf, it's very hard to access. 
So everybody wants to keep this stuff closer to online. Of course, that combines into a really big challenge. But one of the other sort of nice things about this data is it doesn't tend to change. So once you bring it in and do the processing and then store the end product, those files usually don't change. And if you think about what backup is good for, it doesn't make sense to do traditional backup on a lot of files that don't change. It just doesn't make any sense. So there are different ways that we can deal with this type of data that will solve our backup pain and deal with them more appropriately. If you have heard yourself uttering phrases like these, or any of these sound familiar, or you've heard your management saying things like this, these are things we hear from our customers every day. And these are all a sign that you have a problem with unstructured data that you may need to deal with differently. Data growing way faster than your storage budget, that's pretty common, right? When your data doubles, does your storage budget double? Probably not. Uh, data that's too big to back up. You know, you get a 600 terabyte pile of geospatial imagery, you can't just make a copy of that easily every week. Well, I suppose you could, but it would require an enormous investment in backup infrastructure. And that's kind of silly when there's a better way. So these are, these are some symptoms of this problem. And this problem manifests itself a couple of ways. First up, in the primary storage world, that's where you first notice it because you know, your NAS runs out of space, or whatever you're using for storage. But it also cascades into your backup. So what can you do about this? Well, on the primary storage side, the most common answer is buy more storage. Right? That's what you do. You run out and you buy more. But at some point, if your needs are great enough and your growth rate is high enough, you can do a little math and see that this is not a sustainable way to do things. You can't keep everything online all the time. And there are additional problems with common scale and as platforms. For certain use cases where you need to do high-speed processing of data, they just may not be fast enough. And if you were to buy systems that were fast enough, you couldn't afford to buy enough to store all of your data. So you need to be selective about what goes on faster storage. Stuff's expensive, right? I mean, this isn't cheap, and if you double your data and you have to buy twice as much storage, you know, that's a linear scaling model of cost. And then it gets worse because if you're going to back this up, you've got to spend money on a backup system. When you get to petabyte scale and you combine that with performance of these systems and the infrastructure around it, they do become too big to back up. You know, there's not enough hours in the day to protect all that data over and over. And as I already mentioned, if the, all that data, if the majority is not changing, you're kind of wasting your time making copies after copies of it anyway. And when these systems fill up, you have a transcription problem. You know, you have to somehow get the data from the old thing to the new thing. And uh, it takes a long time, so you're managing two systems for a while, and you have to somehow orchestrate that so users can still get it data. So it works for a while until it doesn't then you need a new approach. And this is where many people get frustrated and they would like to turn to the cloud. And I'm not here to talk you out of using cloud storage. It's, it's a fantastic innovation. But like anything, there are use cases where it makes sense and some where it doesn't make sense. Take our friend here at the backup show with his 600 terabytes of imagery that was key to his business. You know, we asked him, what, what's all that stuff for? And he said, that's our business. We take this data and we analyze it and combine it, and then we sell the end product to the people like your favorite mapping program. So that data was the lifeblood of their business. You could put your only copy of that sort of data in the cloud, but if it's that important to your business, you might want to think about keeping the copy under your own control anyway. I don't know if I would trust it to someone else entirely. And then with data in the cloud, of course, you have to manage retrieval expectations. You can rejoice over how cheap Glacier Deep Archive is, but it's got a 48-hour retrieve SLA. So is that acceptable to your users and applications? Only you can decide that. When you do pull data out of the cloud, everybody knows that costs money. 
That's how they get you, right? Storage is cheap, retrieval costs. So this leads many people to start looking at some sort of a hybrid cloud strategy where you use the cloud for some things like data protection and DR, but you keep a copy of data on site for things that need frequent retrieval and fast access. And that is thinking in the right direction, in my opinion. So that's the primary storage side, but let's just talk about the backup side for a minute. Traditional backup is fantastic for all that IT stuff I talked about, the databases, the VM images, PowerPoint presentations like this one. That sort of methodology has been around for decades. It does scale very well into even the petabyte scale if you spend enough money. And it's good for keeping data for a lot of years but it's optimized for data that you hope to never have to access. And you access very infrequent. Right? This is not for active data. If you move to an approach that's more of an active archive for this unstructured data, then there are different methods of protecting it. Instead of things like fulls and differentials and incrementals and synthetic fulls and all that, you focus on copies and versions. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. This sort of approach scales much better because you don't spend a lot of time repetitively copying data that hasn't changed. And it's a way that you can keep a lot of data for a long time. And if you do it right, you can keep it near line. You can keep it much more accessible than a backup that sits somewhere on a shelf. So it's great for data that you know you're going to need to use later. Okay. So let's say you have an unstructured data problem killing your backups, you see the sense of doing something different, maybe a hybrid cloud, active archive sort of approach, what can Quantum do to help you with that? Well, we have a software product that has been around for many, many years called Storenext. And I'm going to give you a very, very short explanation of what Storenext is, and then in the hope of making it more real, I want to go through some customer use cases and show you how customers are using this to solve their unstructured data problems. And I think that, that should help you more than me just reading off lists of features. So here we go. This is a basic picture of a Stonex system. You have some unstructured data that lives on some high-speed primary storage under the Stonex umbrella. And that high-speed storage is backed up by a larger quantity of secondary storage, which can be cloud, object storage, tape, any of those, or all three. And the nice thing about this is all the data that you put in, whether it still resides on the disk or whether it has been truncated and only lives on secondary storage, all those files appear available and they're still sitting in a single namespace and you can access them right from a file system interface. So as far as the key characteristics, this system is self-protecting. And what I mean by that is when a file lands on the primary storage, policies that you configure make copies, essentially immediately, within a minute or two, make copies off to secondary storage tiers that you control and you configure. So, for example, if you've got an on-site object store and you want to keep a DR copy in the cloud, <clears throat> whenever a file lands on this primary storage, a copy is made to the object store and a copy is made to the cloud right away. So this is a system you never have to run a traditional backup against because it protects itself continuously. As I described, it's production storage and an active archive in one. Now, we have some customers that just buy this system as an archive. Their production storage is all set. They have their, their workflow figured out. And when they're done with a the project, they copy data into Storenext. But it's really the most powerful when you do your work with the unstructured data on the Storenext primary storage. Because then you, you don't have to copy it, and everything remains accessible. So buy whatever performance storage you need, from NVMe to flash to regular disk or a combination. You can do your work on that high-speed storage, and then the policies protect all that data you're creating with copies and versions. 
transparent access here, I use that term as shorthand just to mean that all the files you put in the system always remain visible and accessible. You can access the system via SMB and NFS, which is common NAS protocols. If you need higher performance, you can access it with our proprietary client that runs on Windows, Linux, or Mac. And you can even access it via S3 if you want to use this as an object store front end. So very simple to store and get at all your stuff in a very familiar way. Combines high performance because you can have very high performance storage on the front with low cost because that smaller amount of high performance storage is backed up by a larger amount of less expensive storage. So you get the best of both worlds. And also because of this architecture, it's exceedingly scalable. Hundreds of petabytes, exabytes, not a problem. So that is the nickel tour of Storenext. And now I want to show you how some of our customers are using it. Depending on what industry you're in or have industries you've been in, you may think of Storenext as a media and entertainment focused product. And it's true that that's, that's a vertical which we're very, very well known. And it's because Storenext fits the needs of that market. And that market has had problems with large digital data for a long, long time. However, there's nothing about Stonex that makes it inherently media and entertainment specific. We have lots of customers and lots of published case studies that are not m and &E specific. And this is a partial list here on the screen. I'm going to spend the rest of my time here going through just a couple of these to show you in a little more detail how these customers are using Stonex. First up is the Australian Genome Research Facility. This is an organization in Australia, no surprise, and they do genome sequencing and offer these services throughout the country. As you can imagine, they have a lot of data and it's growing very, very rapidly. And they knew they needed a new way to take care of this. They, they were using traditional backup and it just wasn't working. So they implemented Storenext. And as you can see in the quote at the bottom, now their data is protected in the Storenext archive, all that large unstructured data, and their backups are no longer broken. And that's one example down under. This one here is kind of neat. I, uh, I was in their data center a couple of years ago on another assignment, but it's a pretty interesting organization. The Texas Advanced Computing Center is at the University of Texas at Austin. And they have a supercomputing center that is a shared resource for researchers. And it's run as a, as a shared service. So they charge researchers for compute and for storage. And unlike the old days, pre-cloud, they're now com they're competing, right? Researchers can go on Amazon and buy a bunch of machine instances and go do their work there too. They can also store their data in the cloud. So attack has to be cost competitive, both on the compute and the storage side. They had an old uh, Oracle SAN QFS archive system that they were using, and it really wasn't meeting their needs anymore, so they were looking for something bigger and better and newer. And they chose Storenext. In this case, you can see there's 1.7 petabytes of primary storage, disk in this case, on the front, backed up by 55 petabytes of LTO tape in the Scalar i6K tape library. Now, the nice thing about this is this looks like a 56.7 petabyte file system. All that storage is right there and available. And it's accessed by researchers via NAS as well as with our Storenext client, either over fiber channel storage network or over Ethernet. We were able to import their existing data that was on the SAN QFS system, import that database into Storenext and read those old tapes. So we also saved them a huge transcription. Next up, here's one I, I can't name because we don't have their permission because frankly, most companies don't let vendors quote their name. However, trust me, if I told you their name, you would know who they are. They're a very large global content company, and they were formed 
a few years ago by the merger of two very large global content companies. So they're enormous. And as part of this merger, they had an effort to try to consolidate their facilities and consolidate their storage. And as part of that, they chose Storenext, at least for this particular site. It's a large site, they have a large system, and they're really using it to the maximum. They're doing live studio recording right into Storenext, and then they have about 30 editors that work on that footage, again, right on the Storenext shared primary storage. They have about another 100 or so additional users that need occasional access or lower performance access to the content. This is the marketing department, uh, it's people doing QA, it's all sorts of ancillary uses. And they also access that content right off Sternext. They had a legacy archive as well, most of these organizations do, and this was one being, uh, it was under Diva software. And Diva is very common archiving software for m and but it was a tape-based archive, and they wanted to move all of it to the cloud. So again, here, we were able to import the Diva database so that Stonex could directly read the content on the tapes that Diva had written. And then they used Stonex to migrate that content to the cloud. The beautiful thing is the whole time, while this migration is happening, users just saw that content sitting in the file system. It was completely transparent to them where it actually lived and it all remained accessible. And this whole thing was under the control of a media asset manager system called Cantemo. And that's very common in ME to have one of these MAMs, as they're called, that's calling the shots. So a great use case with some cloud archiving, tape migration, et cetera. Next up is a private university in New Jersey. And this is an interesting one because they're doing a little bit of uh, partitioning and sharing of, of systems. They've got about a petabyte of disk under Stonex control, and they're backing it up with Scalar i6000 LTO tape library. They have their HPC cluster. They're using Luster for the production file system for that. And then once researchers are done using that system, they move their data off Luster, and they just drag and drop into Storenext. So in this case, this is a back-end archive separate from their production storage. And they're just using NAS to do that. It makes it very simple. One of the unique things about this is that tape library in the back-end is shared. And this is something you can do with an object store. You can do it with a tape library. So they're sharing that resource between their HPC storage and just their regular corporate IT type backups. So just because you have a separation between your unstructured data and your regular corporate IT data doesn't mean you necessarily have to have totally separate infrastructure. There are opportunities to combine. And they're using Veritas and Veeam for that traditional backup. Okay. Last up here we have CRE. This is an organization in France, and they take satellite pictures of the Earth, they take maps of the surface of the Earth, maps of the ocean surface, maps of the bottom of the ocean, all sorts of geospatial and mapping data, combine it and analyze it. And their customers are people like governments, um, satellite agencies, scientific research, things like that. So needless to say, ACRE has a ton of data. It's growing all the time. And, you know, things like pictures of the planet, you've got to keep that stuff accessible because one of the most common things to do is compare what did this patch of ground look like a year ago or 10 years ago versus what does it look like now. So they, they have a lot of data that needs to be readily accessible. They have two sites, one in Luxembourg, one in Sofia and they are shipping data between those two sites so that they, they protect each other against disaster. And they're just doing that with tapes on trucks. They started out with a small system in Sofia just to prove the concept out, fairly small amount of disk and tape, and then when they figured out they really liked it, uh, they expanded it in Sofia, and then they added the Luxembourg site. 
And speaking of expansion, you know, I mentioned that I mentioned the concept of forklift upgrades before. One of the nice things about Storenext is you can have different types of storage behind it, both primary and secondary. You can add new storage over time, and you can also retire existing storage. And you can do that in a fairly transparent way, having Storenext do the migration from the old to the new. So the system as a whole, the file system, everything remains there. Your users and customers can access it, but you can still be upgrading and expanding storage on the back end in a fairly transparent way. Okay. Last up, I hope that I've got some wheels turning in your head and you're thinking a little bit differently about how you protect your data. And there's a ton more to know about Storenext. So I've, I've scratched the surface, I've shown you how a few organizations are using it, but there's just a lot more there. So I really recommend that you go to quantum.com and download this white paper that goes through the Storenext architecture and features and the things that make it different. Talk about a lot of our patented technology. It's, it's all over the place in the product. And this document will give you a really, really good understanding of what's in store next, what it's capable of. So I recommend that. Looks like we've got a few minutes left here. Let me find my Q&A panel. And uh, by the way, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the Q&A panel here and I'll answer what I can. Okay, first question we've got is asking about uh, is Storenext hardware, software, or both? Well, that's almost a trick question. Storenext is really, is really just software, and it is hardware independent. It doesn't care what server it's running on. It doesn't care what block storage is under it. It doesn't care, you know, what object store or cloud it's connecting to. We have lists that we've, we've certified, but it's very open. Normally, however, just for ease of use and ease of maintenance, Storenext is usually sold running on quantum appliance hardware. So we'll sell you the servers and the storage, put the whole package together, and then you've got one phone call to make if something doesn't seem right. And it makes it much easier to monitor the system because Storenext can monitor the quantum components underneath it. And we don't necessarily have the same capability with third-party stuff. So. Storenext is software, but it's usually sold as a package with quantum hardware appliances, although that's not a requirement. Okay, next. Okay, copies. So it's a question about when copies are, are made. And so I'll, I'll reiterate that. When a file comes in, there's a policy, and when that file is no longer being used, essentially a timer starts. And after a certain number of minutes, Copies of that file are then made to secondary storage. The default in the system is five minutes, which means if you land a file on the file system and it hasn't changed for five minutes, the copies are then made. You can turn that down, four minutes, three minutes, two minutes, one minute, or you can turn it up to half an hour, hour, you know, if you have a need to do that. But typically people leave it at the default of five minutes because that gives you near CDP protection for everything. Now when you change a file, a version is created. So copies mean I may have a copy on an object store, I may have a copy in the cloud. A version is, well, it's what it says. It's a version that captures the changes since the copy was created. Now this concept of um, copies and versions is, is one thing. It's a little different from traditional HSM and then if you think about traditional HSM, data comes in, fills up your primary storage, and then when your primary storage gets full, data gets pushed off to a slower tier. That's not what we're doing, because that doesn't offer you any protection up front. Storenext makes copies immediately, and then when your primary storage fills up, the older files uh, go undergo a process we call truncation, where the data blocks are removed from primary storage and reside only on the secondary tiers. Now the files that are truncated still appear in the file system like normal, and when somebody tries to access them, 
the data blocks are copied back from secondary storage back to primary. So it's, it's a self-managing system in that way. Let's see if we've got any other questions. Looks like that's a no, and we're a little over time. So thank you again for your time this morning. Really appreciate it, and I hope you attend some of the other sessions in our virtual queue event.